Hey guys, so today in this video, we're going to be going over all of the possible ACT math formulas that you might potentially need on the ACT math exam. Some of these are very basic and essential, like slope intercept form, midpoint, distance. We're going to not only teach them, but provide examples and try to make them even more simple for you. Uh, and we're also going to go over some of the more complex formulas that you might end up running into on like a pre-calc or a calculus class. Regardless of how complex or simple it is, all of these are things that have popped up on the ACT math exam before, so these are all going to be helpful for you. Before we get into any formulas, just wanted to mention that uh, it would be great if you guys subscribed. Uh, we make free content on YouTube for you guys, so having subscriptions helps us just continue our content production. And we're going to be going over about 50-ish different formulas today, uh, so there's a lot of stuff here. Even if you've seen most of the things here, um, see, seeing all the formulas in the video is just going to help you even more. So let's get into it. All right, logarithms is the very first thing. So you can see I have five different formulas here. The main essential thing you need to know is this right here. So if you have an expression like this, for example, two to the X equals 10, the question then becomes, how do you find X? Like, how do you solve for this? There isn't really a way to do it by hand, but if you remember this and this, then you can solve it by just plugging this into your calculator. So in this case, Y would be 10, two would be B. So your answer is just log of 10 divided by log of two. And that's it, that's all you have to do. Um, you can also plug this in if you have a graphing calculator, but even with a simple calculator, you can do this. Down here, I have some more advanced pre-calc logarithm rules. You don't need to know these, but just something you can keep in mind. Um, you can plug in numbers into these just to check them, but you have an exponent rule where you can take this coefficient and turn it to an exponent. You have the addition rule where you turn addition into multiplication, and then subtraction goes into division. Okay, very simple. Now let's do properties of exponents. This might be the most important uh formula that you need to know in the ACT math test. So the very first one, these two kind of go together. It's very simple where you have the same base uh, and you multiply or divide, you can turn that into addition of the exponents or subtraction uh, correspondingly. And again, I, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm not going to give examples for each one of these because it's going to take time and I don't want to take too much time on this, but plug in different numbers for A, X, and Y, and B here for all these examples and see how they work because you'll see that they do end up working out. Um, with with the next one here, you'll see that you can uh, basically, when you have an exponent to an exponent, you can just multiply the exponents. When you have, um, these two kind of go together as well. So when you have a, two things being multiplied together and raised to an exponent, you can actually split it by just distributing the exponent to each thing. Same thing with division. This is really the same thing as above. And then these last few, these two are very simple. Plug in numbers for A, you'll see that that's true. This is extremely important. This, if I was to give you one that was the most important, it would be this and maybe these two as well. But the point here is you can convert a negative exponent to a positive exponent by just flipping the term. So uh, three over five to the negative one is the same thing as five over three to the one. Okay, that's the same thing actually. Um, or you can do one over three to the fifth is equal to three to the negative five. Okay, same idea. Um, and then this is also something else that you can remember. I would recommend you check this on your calculator as well so you don't, so you make sure you haven't messed it up. All right, let's move on to sequences. This is also very important. Um, I can spend a lot of time on this. I don't want to because we have a limited amount of time and I want to get through everything, but there are two sequence formulas you need to know. One is for arithmetic sequences where you're adding something every time and geometric where you're multiplying something every time. So with arithmetic, your AN just represents like the 50th term or the 12th term or the third term. So A3 would be your third term and that has a value. A1 is your first term. That's something you need to know in order to calculate AN. Uh, then you have n, which is just your term index. So if you're looking for your third term, n would equal 3. Okay, that's just your index. And then d is the common difference. So like if you have a sequence that looks like this, your d value is just going to be 3 minus 1 or 5 minus 3 or 7 minus 5. It should be the same value between all the terms in order for it to be an arithmetic sequence, okay? Now for geometric, it's the same idea. This is your term actually that you're looking for. This is your first term, n is your index, r is your common ratio, and that is the ratio between all your terms. So if your um, you know, sequence looks like this, three, six, 12, 24, well then your ratio is just gonna be this one divided by this, or this divided by this, or this divided by this. They're all gonna be the same number, which is going to be two, okay? That's your common ratio there, all right? Now, there's different ways that you can apply these formulas and calculate these things. I recommend you watch the 52 math skills video where I actually go through an example. I also have a practice exam full breakdown video where I, where I go through an example of this. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that for that one. This is also an essential formula you need to know. Quadratic formula. So when you have an expression like this and it's equal to zero, specifically when y is equal to zero, you can solve it using this formula, okay? Um, there's, a, there's another way to solve quadratics I'll mention in a second, but some notes about this. Um, if b squared minus 4ac is a positive number, 
So if this ends up being a positive, then you end up having two real solutions. If this ends up equaling zero, then your only solution is just going to end up being negative b over 2a, which is kind of neat. Um, and then if this ends up being a negative number in here, then you get imaginary solutions where you have like i, right? Um, how exactly you apply this and use this formula, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do in this video because um, I want to talk, talk about foiling. So when you have an expression like this, x minus a times x plus b, for example, you can foil this and uh, expand it into an actual quadratic equation. And the way you do that is by multiplying the first terms together, so x times x is x squared, then the outer terms, which is going to be x times b, so we're going to add bx, and then you do the inner terms, so negative a times x, so minus ax, and then you do negative a times b, which is your the two last terms, so minus ab. And that is your answer. You can actually group the middle two terms always, so that'll turn into plus um, b minus a times x minus ab, okay? That's how you do this. The next skill is linear equations. So there are two different ways to approach them. And it, the way th that you end up choosing really depends on what you know about your linear equation. Because the goal here is to find the actual equation. You might just be given little pieces of information. So for both of these, you need to know the slope. You need to know what the slope is. Okay, so that's a prerequisite. Now, the other uh, thing that you might or may not know is either the B value or a point on the line. So if you know the slope and you know B, then this form right here is your way to go. And the B value right here is your Y intercept. So that's going to be some point of the form zero comma b. Okay, so you, if you have a line, there's going to be a point where that line touches the y-intercept or the y-axis. So this right here, this point is zero comma b, and that's that b value is that ends up being in the formula. Now you might just be instead of given that actual point, you might just be given a point that's just out in the middle of the line, like this one right here. You might be given uh, some x x one comma y one point. If that's the case, then you should use this form of the equation. Um, it'll give you, so if, if let's say that uh, my slope was three and my point was three comma three, okay? Then my equation, if I use this, I can actually get it just by plugging these in to here. So that would end up being y minus three equals three times x minus three. And then you just, you know, kind of move things around. So you get y equals three x minus nine plus three. And that's just the same thing as y equals three x uh, minus six. So that's your equation. If I calculated it correctly but the point is you end up getting the same form it's just you're using different pieces of information to get there okay so that's how this works next we'll talk about midpoint and distance these are the two things that people probably confuse and mix up the most so let me talk about each one by itself you have these long formulas that uh, you could use to remember this but I really don't recommend that you even consider those you can memorize them but it gets confusing if you try to Midpoint is really just the average of your uh, x and y values of your points. So if I give you like two points, two comma four and 10 comma 12, the midpoint is just gonna be the average of their, your x values and the average of your y values. And you're gonna put a comma between them. So the average of the x values is just gonna be two plus 10 divided by two. That's going to be six. The average of your y values is going to be four plus 12 divided by two. And that's going to be eight. So I really just did what I wrote here in the formula, but this is just too much to remember. It's easier to just remember to do an average. This is confusing, so that's why I crossed that out. Now for distance, distance formula is really just the Pythagorean theorem. I mean, if you look at this, it's really d squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared. Now what is delta x and delta y? So let me give you an example. Let's draw the coordinate axes and let's say I have two points. Now I can draw a line. This line represents my d, my distance. I can also turn this into a right triangle where this distance right here is just going to be my change in x value. So I have an x value here, I have an x value here. The difference in those x values is gonna be delta x. And then this height right here is going to be delta y. As long as you can calculate those differences, then this formula or this formula right here becomes almost intuitive because it's just a Pythagorean theorem analysis. And that's really, if you look at this, what you're doing here is x2 minus x1. That's really what the difference in x is. And the good thing about this formula is it doesn't matter what sign you use. So you can do x1 minus x2 or x2 minus x1. It doesn't matter because you're squaring it. Uh, and then and then after that, you're adding it. So it doesn't matter what order you do it. And you're just looking for the distance, the absolute value of the distance. Okay. So let's talk about Sokotoa and Chojikao. A lot of you probably know what this is, but you might not know what that is. And these are both very important. So let's go through it. So if I have a right triangle where one of my angles is 90 degrees and I have a hypotenuse and I have an angle theta, any angle, it could be this one or the other one that I drew. So I'm just going to go with the first one. Um, the opposite side is going to be the side that this angle opens up to. So this angle is opening up to this side right here, which means that my opposite, in this case, I'll just label it A, is going to be A. The hypotenuse is the longest side. So in this case, it's clearly just, it's always the one opposite of the 90 degrees. Okay, so 
in this case this is going to be c and the adjacent side is the side that is not the hypotenuse that is touching the angle so that's going to be b okay so we can just find the sine ratio for um this triangle we can find the cosine we can find the tangent and all these things below as well um so this ends up being a over c this ends up being b over c this ends up being a over b okay it's a bit sloppy now that's all that is but what uh, what do these things down here mean basically cosecant is where you flip sine so notice how this is opposite of hypotenuse and this is just the opposite like i just flipped it um secant is where you just flip cosine so again adjacent over hypotenuse to hypotenuse over adjacent and then cotangent is where you just flip tangent so these things here are just related. The so is related to cho, the ka is related to sha, and toa is related to cow. That's really how it works. Um, there's not much else that you need to remember, but I'll leave it at that for this one. Let's talk about amplitude and period. These are two things that are very important, especially period. So I'm going to kind of teach this through an example with an equation. So um, let's say we have y equals 6 sine of 2x, okay? So if I graph this, you're going to get something that looks like this right here. And it continues with the same pattern forever. The amplitude is the maximum value as well as the minimum value. So it's going to be plus 6 and minus 6. Okay, they both are my A, the amplitude. The period represents the distance from peak to peak or from minimum to minimum. Okay, so this distance right here is the same as this distance right here. Okay, you can also consider it as every other x-intercept. That's the same distance. So the point is, that's the dis that distance right here is P, which is my period. And that's something that'll help you graph the equation so you actually know what's happening. So in this case, my period is just 2 pi over 2, which is just pi. So this distance is pi, okay? These are things that are very important to understanding how sine, cosine functions work when you graph them. Um, one other note is that sine functions, when you have it in this form, they will always go through the origin. Whereas if I graphed a cosine function, it would have looked something like this. It would have gone through the point... 0 comma 1 but it would have represented the same type of pattern like repeating forever kind of like the sine one that i drew okay so that's how that works for amplitude and period let's talk about area so this is pretty important because you're given a lot of geometry problems um i have a four different formulas that you really need to know the rest of them if they end up giving you like area of another shape they'll probably give you the formula for it but these are the things that you have to memorize so let's start with the parallelogram what exactly is a parallelogram it's any four-sided shape where one pair of sides is parallel to one another and the other pair of sides is also parallel to one another so that means basically it could be a square it could be a rectangle and it could be a rhombus like this so these are parallel and these are parallel okay so as long as you know what the height is and you know what the width is, you can find the area. It's just going to be length times width. It's that simple. Even if it's this shape, yes, believe me, it is just length times width. Um, that's It's just how it works. For a triangle, um, you need to know the height and you need to know the base. That's it. And you just do this formula. For a circle, you need to know pi r squared. So this distance from the center to the outer radius, that is your radius. And the pi is just a uh, constant 3.14159. For a trapezoid, uh, it's where you have this type of shape right here. So B1 and B2, you have to basically find the average of B1 and B2 and then multiply by the height. So you're really just turning, when you do the average of this, you're turning this shape into a rectangle with that average, uh, we'll call it B bar as your width and then the same height. So it's just taking the shape and turning it into basically this right here. Okay, so that's how that works. That's area, pretty straightforward. Probability, this is probably one of the most important formulas that you need to know for this exam. So the generic probability, if I'm giving you like some scenarios or whatever, the probability of any event is the number of desired outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So let's say I have a bag with six red blocks and 400 total blocks, okay? So what's the probability of me getting a red? It would just be the total number of desired outcomes, which is six, divided by the total number of outcomes. So that's, that's just the same thing as three over 200. And this comes out to like 0.06%, I think, something like that. But the point is, this is my probability. Okay, that's how you calculate basic probability. Now, we have some more advanced probabilities that you also need to know. So, uh, probability of two events happening together, like probability of one event and another, is where you just multiply them together. So, let me give an example. Let's say that the probability of rain today is um, 20%. And the probability of snow is going to be uh, 30%. Okay, just a hypothetical example. So the probability of rain and snow is going to be 20%, uh, it's going to be 0 0.2 times 0 0.3. And that is some number I do not remember, but you can do that on your calculator. You'll get some small decimal. It's like 6% probably, I think. 
the probability of A or B, like rain or snow, is going to be where you add them together. So 0 0.2 plus 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.3, that's 50%, okay? So you added them. So in one case, I believe you get an answer of 0 0.6, which is going to be 6%, and, the, and in the other, you get uh, an answer which is much larger. So just remember, when you have an and probability, you multiply. When you have an or probability, you are going to add them together, all right? That's how that works. All right, this is also extremely important. So let me teach this through an example. Let's say you have a polygon with 65 sides, and I ask you, what is the sum of the internal angle measures? So like for a square, the internal angle measures, well, you know that each one is 90 degrees, so you end up getting 360 degrees as all of the internal angles added up together. For a triangle, you know that all of these, if it's equilateral, they all, uh, they're all 60 each, so you have a total on the inside of 180. Um, so let's say I have a pentagon. So how do I find the internal angle measures? So notice that I add one side and I add 180 degrees. So I should just add another 180 degrees if I add one more side. So we can basically turn this into a formula. Um, it turns into this right here. So you take your number of sides. So in this case, I have five, five sides. And I can find that internal angle measure by just adding, uh, by doing 180 times five minus two. That turns into just 540 in this case. So a pentagon has 540 degrees on the inside. So each one ends up being 540 divided by five, which is 108. So I can give you any number of sides. I can give you 12, I can give you 34, I can give you 62. You can find the internal angle measures. And you notice as, as N gets to a really high number, the internal angle measures becomes um, a very high number as well. So let's talk about special right triangles. This is very important because the entire unit circle is basically based off of this concept right here. And you don't need to memorize the unit circle if you just memorize these two triangles. So what's happening here? Basically, uh, if you have a triangle like that has 60 degrees, 30 degrees, and 90 degrees, or 45, 45, and 90 degrees, then these kind of relationships or these ratios remain true. So if your hypotenuse is one, then this is going to be half of your hypotenuse, and this is going to be your hypotenuse times square root of three over two. So imagine that like these values were actually x, x over two, and x squared of three over two. You can plug in anything for x, or same thing with this, anything, same thing for this, sorry, the five x, three x, four x, and you, you these these ratios will always be true. So this side is always going to be five over three times this side. This side is always going to be a double of this side, okay? If you have these angle measures, that's how it's always going to work. And that becomes pretty important when you're finding similar right triangles or special right triangles, trying to calculate, like if I give you sine of 30 and I ask you what's the opposite side, you immediately know, oh, it should be half because that's what I remember from this triangle, okay? So they just end up asking you about these quite a bit. It's good to remember them. This is another kind of special unique case because it's a three, four, five. I've just seen it pop up on the ACD math exam a lot. Also keep in mind that this could show up in the case of like a six, 8, 10, you just double all the sides, or you get like a, if you triple, you get 9, 12, 15, or you get like a 30, 40, uh, 50, okay, it could show up in any way. The point is, just memorize it, it's only going to help you, okay? And the last thing that I want to go over, it seems like a pretty simple thing, but I'm going to give you an example where it actually kind of gets weird, and that's why memorizing this form is pretty important. So the average of something, which I'll mark as x bar, like let's say we have a list of elements, or a list of numbers called x. So the average of x is going to equal the sum of all of those x terms divided by the number of terms. So um, that's pretty straightforward. Like if I have a list that looks like one, two, three, okay, this is this is my list x. So the average of x is just gonna be one plus two plus three divided by three, right? It's pretty straightforward, it's just two. But let's say I have a, I have a complex problem. Like let's say my test scores average out to a 98% and I have one more test one more test, and I, I want to bring my average to a 99%, okay? So what do I need to score on that one more to get a 99? So this is where this formula becomes pretty powerful. So my x bar has to equal 99, right? Because that's my that's what I'm looking for. My sum of x is what I can, uh, let me actually get to that last. My n is going to equal six because I had five tests before. Now I'm going to add a total of, I'm going to add a total of one, so I, I get six total. Now my sum of x is going to change because before it was 98 basically times five, but now I'm gonna add some unknown test score. Let's just call that y. Now we can plug these three things into my formula and modify my average. So 99 is going to equal 98 times five plus y divided by six. And now you have an equation that you can solve for y. It's pretty straightforward and you'll get your answer. I don't know what it is. It's probably above 100%, but the point is this is an easy way to solve this type of problem, which was, it seemed pretty hard, but it really just comes down to this simple formula. So 
that's how you go about this. Again, remembering these simple formulas that we went over is only going to help you um, because a lot of these exam problems become so much easier if you remember these. So that's it for this video. Like I said before, be sure to subscribe. You can ask us any questions that you have below in the comments. We'd love to help you out. Uh, we also have courses and tutoring on our website. So be, be sure to check that out as well. Um, a lot of students find that helpful. We've had students, we've had students that have improved five to nine points within even a month uh, with our tutoring and our online resources. There's a lot of stuff there that you can find really, really helpful. So be sure to check that out. That's it for me. Best of luck prepping. And if you have any questions or concerns or things you want us to make videos about, be sure to comment them. Um, and that's it for me. All right. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.